Hello and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. Today I want to talk about one of the interesting ways that Canadian law can reach outside of the borders of Canada to affect people for actions taken in other countries. Uh, this is the case of the Queen and Rattray, and I'm also going to have some commentary on Bill C-21 as a result of this. So let's uh, go through this. This one's got some interesting facts to it. So all three charges arise out of the same event. On July 9th, 2005, the appellant purchased a 45 caliber Beretta Storm assault rifle, not an assault rifle, but okay, from a licensed gun dealer at a gun show held in the state of Michigan. At the time of the purchase, the appellant was prohibited from having a firearm in his possession by the terms of the two orders and the recognizance referenced above. So he's on two firearm prohibitions, and he's also on bail conditions that say that he can't have a gun. So the question is, does his having a gun in Michigan violate those orders? For the present purposes, it is accepted that the appellant's acquisition of the firearm in Michigan was not contrary to any laws of Michigan at the time. So he's not breaking any U.S. laws, at least as far as the court knows. Um, he may well have been breaking some Michigan laws, but the court's going to just assume that that was lawful. So the facts. The gun was located in Oakville, Ontario on September 14th, 2005, by a trespasser who was looking about an abandoned barn for any property he might be able to salvage. So, a thief. The trespasser noticed a loose board on the back of a small garage on the property. He removed the board and looked inside and noticed a black case, maybe 16 inches by two and a half feet. He took the gun home and contacted the police. So that's September 14th, 2005. And the police investigation revealed that the gun had been purchased by the appellant on July 9th, 2005 at the gun show referenced above. So close in time, uh, but not like right. It's not like, you know, two days later or something. The appellant was arrested on November 1st, 2005 and charged with the offenses which are the subject of this appeal. He was convicted of those offenses on March 21st, 2006 by uh, just Judge Smith of the Ontario Court of Justice, and then, of course, appealed this decision uh, further up the chain. So the appellant raises two main grounds of appeal. The first ground of appeal is that the charge, when initially read in the oral arraignment, differed from the charges stated in the written information, thereby failing to comply with Section 536 sub 2 of the Criminal Code. The appellant argues that the oral arraignment governs and that because the evidence establishes possession of the gun in Michigan only, and there's no evidence that possession occurred in Oakville as particularized in the oral arraignment, the accused must be acquitted on the first count. So this is a very much an argument on a technicality. They're basically saying when they read the charges out in court, um, they screwed up, they missed some words, and therefore I should be bound by those the words as actually read. Um, I'm not going to go through this one or this particular argument in any more detail because the court says, nah, that's way too much of a technicality argument. You knew what you were charged with. You know, everything was clear. It wasn't that you were in doubt here. So no, we're not going to take that. Now, the second ground of appeal, I think, is more interesting, at least for our purposes right now which is that the second ground of appeal is that the court did not have jurisdiction over the offenses since possession of a gun in Michigan does not constitute an offense in Canada. Section 6 sub 2 of the Criminal Code provides that no person shall be convicted of an offense outside of Canada. On this ground, the appellant maintains he should have been acquitted on all three counts. So basically he's saying, listen, I was in Michigan. I'm not in Canada. Mind your own business, Canada. Let's see how the court deals with that one. So I'm going to skip over this whole oral arraignment argument we just don't care for right now. So the appellant is relying on section 6 sub 2 of the criminal code, which provides, subject to this act or any other act of parliament, no person shall be convicted or discharged under section 730 of an offense committed outside of Canada. They say, in this court, the appellant does not dispute that he had possession of a firearm in Michigan, but says that is not a crime in Ontario, and therefore he ought to have been acquitted of all charges. The argument is that the law of Canada does not reach beyond its borders. Now, let's stop and think a little bit about what's going on here. So he buys a gun in Michigan, and the police are upset because it's found in Ontario. Clearly, people think he might have brought the gun across the border, but they can't prove that. They don't actually have any evidence that he did that. Uh, somehow, this gun gets across the border, but they're never going to be able to prove that was him, Unless, say, he was dumb enough to talk to the police, which would be a bad idea. And it doesn't look like he did that. So 
this is why they're all really keen to get this guy is they think he smuggled this gun across the border, but we're not going to be able to charge him with that. Um, and you got to think, I mean, there is a possibility there. There's several months that go on. So it could be that he buys this gun, takes it to the range out in Michigan, you know, shoots it, enjoys it, decides, yeah, I'm done with this one, sells it on to somebody else. And then that person smuggles it across. We don't know. I mean, that's a possibility, and it's one that the Crown is never going to be able to disprove here. So he's only charged with these breaches of these orders. They say it is important to consider the substantive nature of the charges. The appellant was not charged with possession of a firearm, an activity which was perfectly lawful in the state of Michigan. He was charged with breach of three orders of Canadian courts, orders made in Canada and orders which the Crown alleges governed his conduct worldwide. When the appellant came into possession of the assault rifle, again, not an assault rifle, he was in breach of specific terms of each of a court order, a probation order, and a recognizance, all of which required that he not possess any firearms. So he's triple banned. The appellant concedes that since the Griku decision, this court has determined that, at least in respect of a probation order, a person may be convicted in Ontario of breaching a domestic court order by committing an offense beyond the borders of Canada. And skipping ahead a bunch here just to cut down on time. Uh, I'll try to link the decision in, uh, in the description below. While possession of an assault rifle in the, uh, that may be lawful in the United States, it was not for this appellant in Canada. This weapon found its way to Canada and, but for the happenstance curiosity of a trespasser, would in all likelihood have ended up on the streets of one of our cities. The carnage that has resulted in our cities by the use of illegal weapons is well known and of grave concern to Canadians everywhere. So you see here, they're really kind of upset because they're blaming him for this thing ending up in Canada. That's clear here. In the circumstances here, it is only Canada that would have an interest in ensuring that these orders are complied with. The United States has no such comparable interest. As the court noted in Greco at paragraph 42, once it is understood that Canada is the only country that has an interest in ensuring compliance with orders made by Canadian courts, little more need be said in terms of the real and substantial link test. The probation order in the instant uh, case was imposed upon the appellant by an Ontario court. It required him to keep the peace and be of good behavior both at home and abroad. Importantly, the offense in issue arises out of a breach of that order, a factor which I consider to be crucial in the application of the real and substantial link test. To the extent that he breached that order, Canada alone has an interest in bringing him to justice, and it may do so. The requirements of international comedy do not dictate otherwise. In my view, it matters not that the underlying conduct did not constitute an offense under the laws of the jurisdiction where it took place. It is not the underlying conduct of possessing a firearm that is the subject of prosecution, but rather the breach of court orders made and enforced in this country. However, those court orders are for, you know, are covering possessing a firearm. I have no hesitation in concluding that the offenses of breaching court orders were committed in Ontario and that section 6 sub 2 of the criminal code has no application. So all of this is a little interesting because how do they decide that this took place in Ontario when it clearly took place in Michigan? Well, the way they do that is that the order comes out of Ontario. However, um, interesting sort of wrinkle on that. Let's say you get an order in Ontario that says that you are not to communicate with a particular person. And then you move to British Columbia, and it turns out that person has also moved to British Columbia, and you decide to, you know, go to their house and start harassing them, thereby breaching the order. They'd actually charge you with that breach in British Columbia, not in Ontario. So this does seem like a bit of an inconsistency here. But what this tells us is that when you get a firearm prohibition here in Canada, they can and will prosecute you for breaching that anywhere. So sometimes people say, oh, well, I could just go to Vegas and shoot at their ranges and that would be fine. And the answer to that is no. However, um, I said that there was going to be a Bill C-21 tie-in and there is. So one of the provisions of Bill C-21 allows for any person to bring an ex parte uh, application in order to seek an order of prohibition against another person. So let us consider an interesting example. And I would note that normally in order to get an order of prohibition against a person, you have to, you know, currently 
to get that to that order, there has to be some sort of hearing where you have the opportunity to present evidence on your on your own behalf. They can potentially seize your firearms before then. Uh, they can potentially revoke your license before then. But in order to hit you with a firearm prohibition order that has this additional effect, they have to give you an opportunity to speak up, to make submissions. So let's say you are a soldier overseas. And so somebody brings one of these applications and you don't know about it. And in fact, you know, it wouldn't matter if you're local or whatever, but they bring a firearm prohibition application under Bill C-21 and they get the order because of course a lot of people are going to be able to get these orders because they're being brought ex parte with nobody, you know, you're not able to present your side. You're not able to say, hey, this is not actually what's going on. So um, you're now in a foreign country and, you know, if you're going overseas as a soldier, you are likely expected to be using weapons in some capacity. And lots of things count as firearms when you're overseas, you know, operating in the military. Uh, your rifle counts as a firearm. A handgun counts as a firearm. But so does a tank gun, an anti-aircraft gun, a rocket launcher, a mortar, um, any of the weapon system on a, weapon systems on an aircraft, most of those are going to count as firearms. So suddenly you are banned from using all of the stuff that you're there to use. Well, you're not going to be able to fly back in order to get this, you know, countered. You're going to be just stuck with this prohibition. And it's in effect until and, you know, until you get to challenge it. So a soldier overseas in a combat zone who gets hit with one of these is put into a really unusual and really difficult position. So Bill C-21 has this potential to be really bad for serving soldiers. Um, you know, there's a question of how they'd get this document to you, but I assume that the military has the ability to serve legal documents. That said, I could imagine the, the military going, oh, you want us to serve this firearm prohibition? on this guy overseas, we'll get right on that crumple, crumple, toss. Uh, but yeah, I I really don't like the way Bill C-21 proposes to upend the current system where in order to get a firearm prohibition, you have to at least let somebody have the opportunity to, you know, to tell the court, hey, this is what's going on. You know, please don't ban me from guns. I'm overseas. I'm getting shot at. I need to be able to shoot back. So, yeah. Anyway, I thought I'd share this case with you. It's a bit of an interesting one. There are actually some other provisions uh, by which Canada says that it can exercise jurisdiction over people in other places, including, in some cases, in space. Um, maybe I'll cover that criminal code provision in a little bit. I also want to finish off senior fairly soon, but uh, this one kind of came up and I thought it would be fun. Anyway... Thank you for watching. Please like this video. Please share it with your friends. Uh, subscribe to see more content. I really do appreciate, you know, when you're helping this channel grow. I also want to thank my Patreon supporters at the $50 level. Sir Daniel Wicks of Alberta, Jason Elliott, D. Mo, Canada's National Firearms Association, North Central Process Service, Kyle Martin, Jean-Guy Toussaint, Ivo Nedev, the CCFR, BCAMF.org, Andrew Schaefer, and the Canadian Shooting Sports Association. At the $20 level, Matt Ward, Mark Whittington, Dale Nesbitt, Cameron Johnson, Andrew Elsich, and Adam Meester. And at the $30 level, Sights and Arms Limited and Mark olivier Demour. That was kind of out of order, but forgive me here. I also want to thank everyone at the $10 level who will be in the crawl immediately following. Thank you for watching. I hope this has armed you with knowledge, and uh, I really hope that they uh, rethink some of the things in that bill. It's really a bad bill. Anyway. Thanks. Until next time.